Well, hello and welcome to our midweek Bible study. This is week three of our midweek Bible study on the book of Joshua, where we are taking either sections of the scripture that we're not going to be able to get to on Sunday mornings in our short series on Joshua, or um, this week talking about an issue that has come up, developed in the midst of all of this with the book of Joshua. And so um, we're walking through this book uh, just a little bit by a little bit, and we're going to actually jump ahead pretty quickly after this week. But the, the foundation of everything that we're doing is set up in the midst of this. And so um, this week we're going to talk about a particular issue that comes up in the book of Joshua, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, but I just want to remind you of where we are in the book. And so this is an outline that we've been looking at each week in the book of Joshua, and you can see here it divides into three main sections. Um, with a couple at the bottom, the two sections are kind of together a little bit. But you have Joshua leads Israel. You have the battle with the Canaanites, the war part of this. You have Joshua dividing up the land. And then at the end, you have Joshua rededicating himself and others to the Lord. And so uh, as you kind of look at these, these sections, you can kind of see chapters 1 through 5 as preparation, chapter 6 through 12 as the battles, and chapters 13 through 24 really as post-victory um, settling in. All right, And so as we've looked, we are moving officially into this section of chapter 6, which shows uh, really starts with the battle of Jericho. Maybe at the end of chapter 5, we talked about it on Sunday morning with the warrior of the Lord showing up. But chapter 6 is when the battles begin and Jericho is there. And one of the themes throughout this book, and one of the themes here, is that the Lord is fighting for Israel. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. But he is going to fight for them as long as they're faithful. And so the point, you see just on the screen there says the point, then you can't read what it says, is to inherit the promised land, they must be obedient to what God has called them to do. And so that's where we are in the book of uh, Joshua as we're walking through this book together, right? And so as we do that, there was an issue that came up as we were kind of walking through on Sunday that I thought we needed to spend a little bit more time with, all right? And so it comes in the book of Joshua here. It takes me a minute to sometimes get my... There we go. In the book of Joshua, chapter 6, verse 16, and it says, After the seventh time, now if you remember, when it comes to the battle of Jericho, God had told him to march around for seven days. Once a day until the seventh day, when it would be seven times on the seventh day. So they do that. And the priest blow the ram's horn. Joshua says to the troop, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city, he says, and this is the part we want to really talk about today. The city and everything in it are set apart for the Lord or to the Lord for destruction. And so when you read that, what we read about and what we understand and what we'll see in just a moment is that everything here means everything. Everything in Jericho is set aside to the Lord for destruction. A part of what's behind this is the Lord is reminding them that this is Yahweh's battle. And so the people of Israel should receive no reward for the battle. And so they're going to kill. We'll talk about the reasons for that. They're given the command to kill those that are in, in Jericho, everyone in Jericho, man, woman, child, everyone, the livestock, and anything that's precious metal, they are to keep and set aside for the purpose of dedicating it to the Lord in his temple. So it says, so the troops shouted and the ram's horn sounded. This is verse 20. We jump down a little bit. When they heard the blast of the ram's horn, the troops gave a great shout. The wall collapsed, so just as God had promised. The troops advanced into the city, each man straight ahead. I talked Sunday morning about the fact that they were running to the battle, in my understanding. They captured the city, and they completely destroyed everything in the city with the sword. Every man, woman, 
young, old, ox, sheep, and donkey. They destroyed them all. And so here's the question that I want to talk about today for just a few minutes. Why is this okay? Now we think about the calling of God on our lives, and we think about what we believe God to be and to be about, the question that we ask is, why is it okay for God to demand, God to command, and for the people of Israel to do this, to completely destroy everything, every man and woman? In wars that are fought today, we understand that there should be, that we require as a world even, people to be sensitive to civilian casualties, and especially women and children. And so why when we read the story of Joshua, we're like, yeah, that's exactly right. That's what needs to happen. That's what God commanded, and it's good. How can this be good? And so let me just say real quickly, as we kind of get ready to go into this, that I don't think there's any way that I'm going to be able to give you a definitive answer that will satisfy every bit of curiosity that you have. And that's because God's ways are not our ways. This is God's command. Ultimately, we trust that God's command is the right command. We believe Scripture to be true. and We believe Scripture to be right. And so, at the same time, God's commands, God's thoughts, God's ways are higher. They're different than our, our ways. And so we're not going to fully understand everything this side of heaven or even in heaven. We will take millennium to begin to understand all of who God is. And so we're not going to grasp this in a 20-minute, 30-minute discussion. But what I do want to do today is ask the question, what does the Bible say to answer that question. What does the Bible say about the Canaanites? What does the Bible say about the Israelites? What does the Bible say about these situations that allow us to know that this is okay? And so I want to first think about the cultural, historical background of what we're talking about here. And so living in this land that God had promised to the Israelites is a group of people called the Canaanites. And the Canaanites were not what you would call moral ethical people by and large. Their culture had running through it massive idolatry, massive moral depravity, even to the point of child sacrifice. They worshipped the god Molech, which allowed, which part of that sacrifice required human sacrifice. Um, it, it required child sacrifice sometimes. And so, what we have in this passage is when God is going into the land, when he is sending his people to the land, first of all, these are not innocent, white as snow, innocent people here. In fact, um, one writer has said about them, this is James Emery Wright, a pastor, he, he talked about the judgment came on them because of their ferocious, habitual, unrepentant wickedness. Ferocious, habitual unrepented wickedness. And I do mean wickedness. The Canaanites were marked by slavery, religious prostitution, sexual cults. Scholars have called the Canaanite cult religion the most sexually depraved of any in the ancient world. They had given themselves over to every kind of sexual depravity, including incest and bestiality. And at their worst, the orgiastic worship of idols included human sacrifice, both of children and adults. There's imagery of their cult sexual practices of them bathing themselves in blood. So what we're talking about here is a group of people that aren't innocent, peace-loving, holy, ethical people. So that's a historical background. Now, we still say, well, people deserve the ability to life. We talk about being pro-life uh, from womb to tomb and like, yes, but God's taken their life early from them, right? We'll talk about in a moment how God has that right. But we know that for, for years, God has been preparing for this moment. And even when he talked to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, he said, the Lord said to Abram, this is before he's even changed his name, right? This is the promise he's given him. Know this for certain, your offspring, your children, 
will be aliens, will be resident strangers for 400 years in a land that does not belong to them and will be enslaved and oppressed. So we have here Egypt while they're there. However, I will judge the nation they serve, that's Egypt, and afterward they will go out with many possessions. Isn't it miraculous to think about, awesome to think about how God is predicting this well before Moses, well before Pharaoh, well before any of them are there, and it happens just as he says. He says, but you will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried in good old age. That's Abram. In the fourth generation, so after the 400 years, fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorites has not reached its full measure. And so he says that they're going to be, um, they're not going to live here initially. There's going to be a 400 year gap. And that at some point, the Amorites, Canaanites, sin is going to fill up and God is going to not overlook their sin anymore. And so part of what we have as the background to what's happening here is God's promise to Abraham. He's given him his word that he's going to provide for him in this place. He's going to provide them a place. He's, this is part of the promise of, I'm going to make you a nation, and out of you, everyone's going to be blessed. And he says, part of that will be they will take the promised land. We also have to understand that God is a holy God. And when you hear about the wickedness of the Canaanites, and you hear about the wickedness of those people, you think about Habakkuk chapter 1, where God is completely opposite. With this, talking about God says, your eyes, that's God's eyes, are too pure to look on evil cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? And so there is this understanding in Scripture that for God to overlook sin indefinitely is for God to go against his own character. Now, we'll talk in a little bit about God's patience. In fact, in just a minute, we'll talk about God's patience and warnings to them. But the point that he is, is he has given them time to repent, time to come back, time to worship. And yet, he has overlooked sin, overlooked sin, overlooked sin, and eventually he had to do something about it. Because his holiness, his purity cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Cannot. And so God has to do something about that. In fact, we know this from the New Testament. It says, for the wages of sin is death. This is the argument for um, why do good people go to hell? Well, the truth is, the first thing that we have to understand is, Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned. And so the reality is there are no good people. And what I mean by that is in God's standard of holiness, there is no one there. And that God has to punish sin or he is unfaithful to himself and to his character. God is holy and his justice and holiness demands that sin must be judged. Your sin, my sin, all sin must be judged. And yet God is throughout Scripture patient with people. He is patient with them about who they are. And so when you think about the reason that God calls for the complete destruction of these people, the first primary reason is God must judge sin. And so he's doing it for the judgment of sin. Look at Leviticus 18. What he tells, this is what he tells his own Israelites. Do not defile yourselves by any of this practice, for the nations I am driving out before you have defiled themselves by all these things. The land has become defiled. I am punishing it for its iniquity, and the land will vomit out its inhabitants. So he has this concept that there is a promised land that is God's people's 
land. And these Canaanites that are on it are defiling it by their sin. And that unless they are completely wiped out, they will continue to defile the land of God's people by their sin. This is divine judgment on the Canaanite nations for their persistent sin and rebellion. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 9. When your Lord your God drives them out before you. So when the Lord drives them out. So this is Deuteronomy right before Joshua. God's going to do it. God's giving them the land. He says, when that happens, don't say the Lord brought me to take possession of the land because of my righteousness. Instead, the Lord will drive out these nations because of their wickedness. You're not going to take possession of the land because of your righteousness and your integrity. Instead, the Lord your God will drive out these nations because of their wickedness in order to fill the promise he swore. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's evident here that it has nothing to do with the Israelites being good that gives them the right to drive these people out. They are driven out because of their wickedness, their persistent, horrible, defiling wickedness. So that's the first reason that God tells them to get rid of all of them. Everyone who does these acts is detestable to the Lord, and your Lord, your God, is driving out the nations because of these detestable acts. That's Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 12. That's the reason the Bible says that the command is given partially or primarily because he had to judge their sin. But then there's also the protection of Israel. There was a need to prevent Israel from falling into the same sinful practices. There was a need to protect their worship and the purity of their obedience to God. And so it tells us here in Deuteronomy 7. Now remember, Deuteronomy is so important for this because this is Moses summing up everything. It's his last sermon before he dies, and it's right before they go into the promised land. This would have been on their mind as they go, and Joshua would have been repeating this to the people again and again. When you Lord your God brings you to the land to entering to possess, and he drives out the many nations, the Hethites, Gergesites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and powerful than you, and when the Lord your God delivers them over to you and you defeat them, you must completely destroy them. So there's the command. Make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. You must not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. So there's the command in its most basic form. When you go, you destroy them. You don't make a treaty with them. You don't show them mercy, you don't intermarry, you don't do any of that. And then he tells us why in the next few verses. Because they will turn your sons away from me to worship other gods. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will destroy you. Instead, this is what you are to do, to tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, cut their Asherah poles, and burn their carved images. Why did God tell them to destroy everything? To protect the integrity of his people. In other words, if you marry, if you settle, if you live with, they will bring you down. So the first thing is he's got to judge the sin. The second thing is he has to tell them that you have to protect you. Your, the integrity of worship, the purity of the worship, the obedience to God. And if you let them hang around, they're going to bring you down, right? And then the third thing is, uh, by the way, he tells them this at the end of that, for you are a holy people belonging to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be his own possession out of all the peoples. In other words, if you allow them to live, you're going to give up your special place. as God's people. And by the way, we see this. They don't follow God's command in every spot. And as they don't follow God's command in every spot, you see them walking away from the Lord, following other gods. And the last reason that he has them to stay 
or I mean to 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 stay in the land and destroy all the people there is the fulfillment of God's promise. This is the promise he gave to Abram in chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 and it says go from your land and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Make you a great nation, bless you, make your name great, you will be a blessing. I will bless those who hurt, bless you, curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. God has a plan from Genesis to Revelation on how he's going to redeem the world. And at this moment in the plan, it is Abram's family, the people of God. And he says, I need you in the promised land, like I said, without the influence of evil, so that you can be the blessing to those that are around you. Here's something I.H. Howard said about this particular instruction and why it's important for us today. The instruction to Israel to annihilate the Canaanites were specific in time, intent, and geography. That is, was, Israel was not given blanket permission to do the same to any peoples they encountered any time in any place. It was limited to the crucial time when Israel was just establishing itself as a theocracy under God to protect Israel's worship as well as to punish these specific peoples. Harsh as it is to our sensibilities, we should remember that it was for very clearly stated reasons and it was carefully circumscribed. This is for a specific people and a specific place at a specific time. And as a result of that, we can't take this as a blatant statement to, to just wipe out populations of people. But we can take some lessons from it. And I guess that's the question that we kind of want to end with today. What do we do with this? How do we apply what is here? And the first thing that I would say in the midst of all this is that as we think about this, even though we don't have all our answers to all our questions, even though the objections that might come from people seem valid, like uh, how can a loving God command this much death? Like those are valid questions, I think. I think they're important for us to engage in and not just kind of dismiss. But I do think we see the reasons the scripture teaches it because their sinfulness had grown to the point that God could not overlook it because he was protecting his own people from the influence that would have come and he was fulfilling his promises for them and for the world. And so as we think about that, what do we do with it? Well, first thing I would say is we need to praise God's character. There is a balance between God's justice and God's mercy and they are perfectly balanced. Mercy, grace, and justice are perfectly balanced. And our understanding of who God is is not the complete picture of God. And as a result, we can't judge God for his actions. We can ask questions People in Scripture ask questions of God. The psalmist asks questions of God. Now, Job asked questions of God until a certain point. Jesus made requests of God while he was here on earth. And there are evidence in Scripture of prayers where they are longing for answers from the Lord. We can't make him give them to us, but we can ask. But what I know is that our God is a good God, and he is a just God, and he is a right God, but he is also a holy God, and he is in complete control. And ultimately, when we talk about pro-life, one of the things that we talk about is that life and death is in the hands of God. And what we have in this passage is God making the decision in these passages for them to destroy these people. So the author of life and death, the sovereign Lord of the universe, has the right to decide who lives and who doesn't. We may not like that. We may feel like, man, that doesn't seem fair at times. But God is a fair and a just and a right God. And so 
Ultimately, the reality is, and we'll talk about this even more in just a moment, ultimately the question is not why did, you know, when we think about questions of why do bad things happen to good people, why do all that, the ultimate question is why, why does anything good ever happen for us? We don't deserve any of it. Why does God allow any of us to live because of our sinful natures that are there? And so we praise God's character for who he is. We recognize who he is. We don't we, we use this as a moment to say, I don't understand it, God, but I praise you and I serve you and I worship you and I'm thankful for you and you are a good and great and holy and just and loving and merciful God. And even though it's hard for us to think about all those things together, it's not hard for God to live those out because that's who he is. The second thing that we need to do from this passage of scripture and from this idea is that we need to realize the seriousness of sin. I think too often we just... Um, we rationalize our own sin and we don't think it's a big deal. And sin is a huge deal. Um, every time you sin, you're sinning against the almighty God. And so a sin against the almighty God is an almighty sin. And what I mean by that is it is a major sin. It, it, smallest sin is a major sin because of who it is that we are sinning against. And so we need to realize the seriousness of sin. These people were killed, it tells us, primarily because they were people that deserved it because of their sin and their wickedness. And whatever it is in our lives that we need to get rid of, we need to get rid of it. Whatever it is in our lives that's temptation, we need to get away from. Which kind of leads to the next point, which is we need to remember our call to holiness. Just as he told them that they were a holy nation, we're reminded by Peter in the New Testament that we are a holy nation, set apart for the Lord, and that we are to be holy, we're to be different, we're, we're not to look and act and be like the rest of the world, that we're to protect our worship, that we're to protect our most intimate relationships from those things that might lead us away from the Lord, that we're to protect our family from those things that might lead us away from the Lord, from, from different avenues that come into our lives. And we need to remember that we're called to be different, to be set apart. And then the last thing I would just say is we need to rejoice in Jesus. Give thanks to the Lord that he has made a way for us to have our sin wiped away because we would be without Christ, we would be hopeless and I would be outside of the family of God if it were not for the blood of Jesus Christ. And when I think about the seriousness of sin and our desire to be holy and our need to be holy, I'm thankful that God has provided a way for us. And yes, as I read those passages, I am a little uncomfortable with the complete destruction and annihilation. And yet I trust that God is good. And I trust that his plan was in motion that led eventually to Jesus, who blessed all nations of the world because he came to save those who would accept him. And so I would just say rejoice in Christ and the protection we have in him. Thank you again for joining me on this afternoon, uh, morning, evening, whatever it is you might be watching. Uh, and I uh, appreciate you just sticking through these series. Let me know if you enjoyed it. Let me know any questions you ha may have. I'll be glad to answer those next week. Any questions you may have about the book of Joshua in general, uh, just let me know. Uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. And I uh, hope you have a great rest of the week.